Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Nicholas Johnson, and I have been the program note writer for several years now for the Ensemble Music Society. I'm also an associate professor of musicology at Butler University and the director of graduate studies in the School of Music. Um, if you like the kind of stuff I do, I also have a podcast called Classical Pairings that I make with Classical Music Indy, where I talk about cocktails and beer and wine and pair it with all sorts of fun classical music. Um, one of the things I love working about with the Ensemble Music Society is the variety of concerts that they program each and every season, and this year in the May Music Festival is no exception. Now I have another video posted um, where I go down in depth with Morton Feldman's trio uh, from 1980. And so you can go watch that video to learn more about what is a truly fascinating piece. And to be totally honest, one of the, I'm very excited to see this piece live. It's one of the ones I'm most excited to see as part of the festival. In this lecture, I'm gonna be breaking down just a little bit about the other pieces that we will hear during the festival. And I hope that this can give you a little bit more insight, a little bit more, um, can make the, the process and the concert a little more enriching, a little enjoyable. Um, so we're going to be talking about three works by Ludwig van Beethoven and one by Ellen Tafiewicz-Villic. Um, and for each piece, what I'm going to do is talk about one movement, because I'm wanting to keep this video not too long, about the length of a regular pre-concert lecture. Um, but since I have four pieces to talk about, I can't really get into every single aspect of the music. But I thought it might be helpful to talk about one movement from each that I'm the most excited to hear. So maybe it's a little self-indulgent, but I, I know you'll bear with me. Basically, here are my four favorite movements um, of these four works that we're going to hear. Um, and maybe if you can kind of think about these uh, movements, and, and actually I think for, for several of them, they sort of help to center these pieces um, and frame either uh, the work as a whole, where they provide material that's going to be uh, developed later, or they come at the end of the work to provide sort of a recap um, for the composition. So, we're going to be going through the works that we'll hear in the two nights of this festival. I mean, if you have any questions, I believe you'll be able to post those, or you can come and talk to me at the concerts themselves. Let's go ahead and start with the first work. This is Ludwig van Beethoven's Piano Trio, Opus 97. It's often called the Archduke. Uh, the reason, excuse me, the reason it's called the Archduke, which you can read about in the program notes, is because he dedicated it to Archduke Rudolf. It's helpful to talk a little bit about what's happening in Vienna um, when Beethoven writes this composition. Um, the Napoleonic Wars had been raging through Europe for several years, and in fact, Vienna had been a target as much of the war was the Austrian forces against the French forces. And Vienna had fallen peacefully to the French forces earlier, um, but in the late, 18, uh, late 1808, uh, there was a lengthy bombardment of Vienna. Beethoven hides in basements. Many people flee the city because of Beethoven's hearing loss and financial position. He's not really able to leave the city, but many of his friends do. Um, so he spends a year fairly isolated in Vienna as the French army is there um, occupying the city for a while before they eventually leave to try to track down the rest of the Austrian army. Um, eventually, his friends and his patron comes back, the Archduke Rudolf. Um, alongside with this, Beethoven gets a very interesting job offer to actually go work for the Bonaparte family in Germany. Um, he rejects that offer, but um, Beethoven was always a pretty savvy businessman, and he's able to turn that offer into an offer to stay in Vienna um, from the nobility and some, from some wealthy patrons who um, keep him in Vienna uh, for the rest of his life. And this work is dedicated to the patron who made that possible for him. So in some ways, this work is written right after a very tumultuous time for Beethoven, um, you know, with the, the op occupation of Napoleon's forces, but it's also a very thankful piece, uh, one written to his patron and to his safety and hopefully his health. Um, this work is also written during um, what musicologists often call his middle period. Um, those d d um, dividing his work into three periods can be a little too black and white to really understand these works, but they can be a little bit helpful. I'm going to be talking more about his middle period later um, in this lecture, but this is his heroic period. This is when he writes symphonies number three, five, and six, and, and four as well, but three, five, and six are the most famous. Um, there are often sort of heroic, defiant themes within these works. This is a time when, despite all the turmoil, Beethoven is the most famous composer in Vienna and probably in all of Europe. 
Um, he eventually reaches financial stability during this period, but it's also a period where his hearing is getting significantly worse. And he's not quite completely deaf when he writes this piece. He will be for one of the works that we are going to talk about here in just a minute. Um, but he is losing his hearing and he's becoming a little more introspective with his style, but still largely heroic um, and very sort of taking the extremes of the Vienna style that he inherited from Haydn and Mozart and, and literally learned from Haydn, one of his teachers, um, and expanding its dramatic and musical possibilities. So, as I said, I want to focus on one movement for each of these works. Uh, the movement that I can't wait to hear um, performed live is the third movement of this Archduke. And I think that this is probably true for a lot of people. Um, it, it stands out a little bit about from the rest of the piece. The, the second movement is this beautiful sort of plaintive and melancholic, almost Russian sounding uh, movement, which I talk about a little in the notes. But the third movement is this gorgeous hymn that goes through a series of repetitions and different ideas and is, just has the richest harmonies um, that you hear in, in some of Beethoven's works. I mean, it's by itself, this composition, you don't even like, the other movements are all brilliant, of course, but the third movement is one that you can just listen to. And if you're at the right mood, it's, it's a movement that can bring you to tears or can bring you warmth and comfort. Um, it is, uh, a lot of Beethoven's music from this period is very sort of loud and heroic and um, not really March-like, but defiant. This piece is not. This movement is very sort of tender and it shows this passionate side of Beethoven's middle period. Um, and that when, when Beethoven wanted, he could write as lyrical and beautiful as anybody. He just usually chooses not to. Beethoven's music is, is often more sort of harmonically integrated with little short motives that are developed. We'll be talking about those in just a little bit, in fact. Um, but this piece is him exploring lyricism and beauty in a way that really no other composer could do. Um, for this talk, I'm not including recordings. Um, partially that's so that we don't have to worry about posting this online, about anything with copyright or anything like that. Also, I figure you can just pause and go listen to the movement whenever you like. So maybe just go, um, you'll definitely hear it in the concert, um, but I would recommend maybe pausing here and going to just listen to a little bit of the third movement of the piano trio, Opus 97. Um, by Beethoven, um, often called the Archduke. This is from 1811. It's, it is um, one of the most tender and beautiful moments that will be um, shown in this whole music festival. So now I'm gonna go ahead and talk about the piece by Ellen Zvilich. Um, this is, as, as I mentioned in the Feldman lecture, um, I love the fact that the Ensemble Music Society mixes these, the, the, the classic chamber pieces like the Beethoven I was just talking about with some more modern uh, works from the last few decades. And this piece is, is not, even that, not even that old. It's from 2008. Um, and it is by probably one of the most exciting um, and significant American living composers today. I think she definitely is one of those and probably one of the most beloved uh, composers right now. Um, Ellen's Village was the first woman to uh, earn a Pulitzer for composition. Um, she was the first woman to get a doctorate uh, at Juilliard in composition. Um, and her music at one time was very sort of experimental. It was uh, honestly a little bit more akin to Feldman in that other lecture and that other piece. But in the 1970s, she sort of pivots and, and starts to center her music a little more on the audience. With the Feldman and some of their avant-garde composers, there, there's a lot more exploration of the art itself and me breaking music down to its essence and exploring it. The, another trend starting in the 80s and continuing to today is composers being more interested in reconnecting with an audience. And as a music scholar, I can say I respect and value both of those viewpoints. Um, audiences, I think, hopefully enjoy both, but certainly audiences are gonna be more drawn to music like Village, um, which is, we're gonna hear more consonant melodies, harmonies, fun rhythms, those sorts of things. That's not to say this is light or easy listening. This is a really fantastic piece that is full of depth and meaning. In fact, this is uh, one of the very first pieces for this genre. So this piece is a septet of a piano, basically they take a piano trio and a string quartet and smash them together. And you end up with a seven piece ensemble. So you have two cellos, um, you have three violins, you have a piano, and then you have one viola. Um, the movement I wanna focus on for this is the first movement. And it was actually, it was hard to choose a movement because they're all really fun. The third movement is this really fun sort of bluesy jazz thing that you'll, you'll hear. Um, but the first movement, what I enjoy about it 
is Zvilich seems to understand that she's doing something kind of unusual here with these ensembles. And in this piece, excuse me, in this movement, it sounds to me like the ensembles are clashing against each other. It's, it's you know, traditionally this is performed, as we're going to hear, by a piano trio and a string quartet work together. Well, those ensembles don't normally play together. And there is normally hierarchies that already exist of who you're supposed to be sort of cueing off of. You know, I'm, I'm sure you've seen at a string quartet concert, you know, people glancing over at the first violin just to make sure they time the bow strokes and that sort of thing. Well, with this ensemble, you, when you merge these two ensembles, you have the potential for conflict here. And realistically, I think the musicians are, are all good enough to get to not have to worry about that. But um, I think that metaphorically, in some ways at least, um, and potentially practically, there is some conflict here. And this movement, I hear this conflict uh, really quite uh, audibly, I think. I haven't found the village actually mentioning this or talking about this. So this is my opinion of the movement. But what I hear is the forces of the piano trio and the forces of the string quartet facing off against each other, sort of vying for power and musical control in a way that is really, it's, it's really quite fascinating. Um, and then there, there's a moment um, some, uh, kind of halfway through the, the, the movement where you get these loud chords, everybody together. And it's, that's the moment where they, they all sort of finally lock in as a unified force. Um, and in, this, in that way, once they're locked in, they're sort of foreshadowing the rest of the piece. And in fact, there are themes and sort of uh, ex, uh, little pieces of themes that we're going to hear in the later movements that, that come from this first movement. It's also this very beautiful neo-romantic writing. It's dramatic, it's powerful, it's rich in its harmonies. It's unusual in a chamber music concert to have this many instruments on stage in the first place. And Zvelich uses them masterfully to have all of them combine into this um, unified force that is then going to, after this movement, after they've finally locked in together, in the next movement, they go and explore different genres together in a really fun and fascinating piece. Um, so again, I'm not playing the recordings as part of this lecture, but you can pause me and go listen to a little bit, if you'd like, of the Septet for Piano Trio um, and String Quartet by Zvilich. This piece is from 2008. So go ahead and give that a listen. The next work I want to talk about is by Ludwig von Beethoven. Uh, we actually have two more works we're going to talk about by Beethoven for this lecture, and then we'll be done. Um, Beethoven, uh, the work we're next going to look at is his String Quartet number 9. Um, this is from 1806. So this is about, um, this is a few years, about five years before the other Beethoven piece we talked about. So this is before the really bad French invasion of Vienna. I mean, there had been a peaceful invasion, but it hadn't really disrupted the city all that much. Um, Beethoven in 1806 is sort of, he's at the, the a major rise here. Um, his third symphony has already come out. His fifth symphony has already come out. He has become one of the most beloved composers, but also one of the most curious. And it's important to know, especially for Beethoven's music, uh, much like many modern composers today, his music was not loved at first by everybody. Many people did, but many people found his music far too difficult, far too complex, um, and far too sort of obtuse. And just the, his famous third symphony, the Eroica, has re had really mixed reviews at its initial premiere. A lot of people did not like it. They found it to be way too long, for example. Um, I mean, it, it, clearly time has showed the, the power of Beethoven's music over 200 years later. Um, but this work, this string quartet, came out in a set that was somewhat derided by um, the sort of burgeoning musical press that found this string quartet, not this one specifically, but the three string quartets that were published together as Opus 59, that found them as a little too difficult and a little too complex. Um, it's important to remember here, when we're talking about Beethoven's music, especially from the mid eight, like mid, this time period, the middle of this decade, this is music that the main audience is musicians at home, not a concert audience. And so this music was being published for people to buy and play at home, and they were finding it just a little too difficult. They'd been playing the music of Beethoven, I'm sorry, of Mozart and Haydn and some earlier quartets by Beethoven. Um, and then this one comes out and they're having a little bit more trouble dealing with it. Um, this, this movement, um, this piece was 
Uh, had a Russian commission. I think I mentioned a Russian movement in the other piece. I got the two mixed up in my head. Sorry, there's a lot of Beethoven. There was not a Russian theme in that other string quartet, but I'm sorry, in the piano trio, but that's okay. Um, this one has a little bit of a Russian theme in the second movement. Um, what I'm really wanting to focus on here as my movement is the final movement of this piece. Um, the string quartet in C major of the three was the best received in its original sort of, in the first year that it came out. Now, of course we know that, you know, within a few years, and, and up to now, the, these string quartets are sort of the pinnacles of the genre. Um, but again, again, when they came out, they were a little, um, people were a little apprehensive about these works. But the C major one, people were a little more okay with. And part of the reason is this movement. When you listen to the Opus 59, number three, what you hear in the first three movements is sort of res restraint. Beethoven never really dives in to any sort of emotion. When it's a little bit more somber, it's still sort of a, it has an emotional check. It's a little bit of a balanced somberness. Even when it's joyful, it's sort of a, it's a restrained and balanced joy until this final movement when it explodes in this color of virtuosity and passages pass back and forth, these bursts of energy. And it's just, the whole movement is just like a whirlwind. But it's been building and building and building, and then finally in this movement, it explodes. And it's really just fantastic writing that, um, you know, string quartet players have been enjoying playing for a very long time. Uh, today, we think of these as largely um, concert pieces, but as I said, these were mostly domestic pieces. And in domestic pieces, people would just play them however many times they wanted. So this is a movement that would receive a lot of playing, but it works really well as the end piece of this, this whole quartet, because the tension is just going to slowly build and build and build, and then finally the dam breaks, and Beethoven's virtuosic and joyful writing breaks through. So go ahead and listen to, this is the, the fourth movement of string quartet number nine in C major, opus 59, number three. All right, the final piece that I'm going to talk about is one of, in fact, one of Beethoven's final pieces. This is his string quartet in C sharp minor, opus 131. Um, it will be um, the last piece played on, in the concert that it's in on Thursday, I believe. And this piece comes from Beethoven's late period. Um, again, these periods can be a little difficult to define, but pretty much anybody would say, I mean, Beethoven only lived a couple, he lived one more year after this piece, that it's now at least called his late peer, period. Of course, at the time, Beethoven, um, thought his health was going to get better and assumed he was. this was not his late period, but um, unfortunately it was. And so this work is when written when Beethoven is completely deaf, fairly isolated from um, the rest of Vienna. In fact, Be the, the last 15 or so years of Beethoven's life, he's, he's actually quite isolated. And it has to do with the politics I was talking about earlier. Um, Beethoven was sort of an avid supporter of basically Republican politics, by which I mean Republican government as opposed to monarchy. And so we would maybe even say more of a left-wing sort of idea, idealist, you know, looked at the American Revolution very fondly and thought that Austria, which is a monarchy, would do well with a revolution. Well, when the French Revolution resulted in Napoleon, Forces became, uh, the monarchy became much less um, patient with people who wanted a revolution. And pe people like Beethoven sort of had to retreat from the public eye. Um, and he does so and occasionally emerges with works. The, the most famous work from Beethoven's late period is his Symphony No. 9 from 1824. Um, this is the, the heroic Ode to Joy um, movement in it. And, but that work's kind of an outlier. Like we listen to that work regularly from his late period, but really nothing else is like that. And, his, and his, most of his late period music is rather reserved, rather introspective, very sort of plaintive and thoughtful as Beethoven's not really a major part of society at this point um, because he's, he's viewed as sort of a political revolutionary. He's also completely deaf when there is, I mean, there's no sign language doesn't exist yet. He's just writing things down to communicate with people. And he, instead, he retreats to his music and writes these pieces of extremely rich depth and complexity that basically foreshadow the next 80 years of Western musical development. Um, you know, he passes the torch, if you will, to, to Brahms, who's going to pick it up a few decades later. 
um, and continue some of these ideas, or Schubert is going to pick it up immediately and continue with his ideas. Um, so for this piece, the movement I want to focus on is the first movement, which ha is the most almost heart-wrenching and tender fugue that is completely unusual for first movements. Um, there is, you're supposed to do, just like with the other two court, the other two chamber works we've heard, you're supposed to have a sort of loud and joyful and happy um, or sort of some uh, maybe angry. So energy, you're supposed to have energy in the first movement. This is not an energetic movement. It is a very sort of furrowed brow and thoughtful sort of movement. And this fugue that you have these layered ideas, it's also very unusual to have a fugue in a first movement. Fugues are reserved for the last movement. By the way, the one we just listened to um, from Opus 59, the last movement involves a fugue in it. Um, so a fugue is where you stack these musical ideas on top of each other and they get more and more interlaced. People thought that was too convoluted for a first movement. Beethoven didn't care, and so he did it in a first movement. What he also does in this movement is he um, foreshadows all the harmonic centers of the rest of, of, the, of the whole piece as a whole. And it's a little hard to hear this without a score. Um, I'll talk about that in just a second. But it's even as you're listening to this movement, though, there's going to be unexpected harmonic movements. And listening to it at first, you might be, why is he going in that direction harmonically? Um, and the reason is, is he is foreshadowing the keys he is going to go to later in the piece. And so it's this sort of brilliant um, depth of meaning that people might not get on their first listen or playthrough or anything like that. And in fact, that brings up my final point about Beethoven is in this late period, he is largely writing for people who are going to really study the score. He knows that at this point, his music is, is receiving intense scrutiny from music theorists and music critics, music scholars of all types. And this piece is in some ways written to that audience. That's not to say a listener can't enjoy it. It's just to say that a listener might not notice everything on their first listen that is embedded into the fabric of the work. Um, and so if you read music, I, I advise you to actually take a look at the score. But even if you don't, just listen to... Um, the sort of harmonic centers of where the piece is going. One way you can do that, for example, is listen to the first minute, pause it, and then jump ahead five minutes. And we're in a completely different key area um, as he has taken us on this journey. And eventually it cir circles back, but in this really sort of uh, kind of brilliant way. I mean, this, this movement is still studied today regularly as sort of how to handle large scale harmonic planning and movement. Um, the rest of the string quartet, this is a, a little unusual, and it's a seven movement string quartet. It's really groundbreaking, and in fact helped redefine the genre of the string quartet as one of his last major offerings, not only for the genre, but in general. So I hope you've enjoyed this brief overview of these four pieces. Um, I hope you really enjoy the May Music Festival offered by the Ensemble Music Society. Um, it's a series that um, I can't wait to hear. Again, if you haven't listened to my talk on Morton Feldman, if you're at all curious about that piece, just go ahead and listen to that talk, and hopefully it'll give you some information ideas um, about either getting a ticket for that one or to enrich your experience of listening to it. So thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy the music. <laughs>